Hey guys, so today's movie I'm going to be discussing on the channel is the latest in the Hunger Games franchise, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is of course an adaptation of Suzanne Collins' novel from 2020, which itself was a prequel to her trilogy of original Hunger Games books, which were written for young adults. I have read this book, if you want proof, here is a completely unplanned and unstaged picture of me reading the book in the bathtub during the pandemic. I am a fan of the book, in fact I'm a fan of all the Hunger Games books, so I did have high expectations for the new film and for Francis Lawrence who did direct three out of the four original Hunger Games movies. He did Catching Fire and the two Mockingjay movies. And as a fan of the book, I'm happy to tell you guys that I really did enjoy the film version of The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. For all you book readers, it is a pretty faithful adaptation of the book itself. There's a few minor tweaks here or there, a few things are missing, but I will say the bulk of the story is in here and it makes for a very gripping movie. I'm not gonna say this is the best Hunger Games film. I'm not even gonna say that it's the best Hunger Games film that was directed by Francis Lawrence. That honor goes to Catching Fire. To put it into quick ranking terms, you've got The Hunger Games and Catching Fire, which I think are great. Then you've got The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is pretty good. And then you've got the two Mockingjay movies, which were only okay. So yeah, it's a solid entry in the Hunger Games franchise. And I do think it does help to enrich the franchise overall, but I don't think it reaches the greatness of The Hunger Games or Catching Fire. For those of you unfamiliar with the book, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is a character study of President Coriolanus Snow, played in the first four Hunger Games movies by Donald Sutherland. But as this is set in the early days of The Hunger Games, when Coriolanus Snow was just a young lad, way before he was President Snow, he's played in this film by Tom Blythe. The story is essentially a character study of Snow himself, detailing the events that shaped and forged him into the man that he would become. The film is set 10 years after the Great Civil War of Panem, where the capital managed to beat back the rebels of the districts, and now the Hunger Games have been in effect for 10 years. An annual pageant of sorts where two children, one boy and one girl from each district, are selected at random to fight in a televised uh, battle to the death where only one is left standing. The only problem is the citizens of Panem aren't really tuning in to watch The Hunger Games. The ratings are really low. So the creator of the games, Dean Caster Highbottom, played by Peter Dinklage, and the head game maker, Dr. Gore, played by Viola Davis, devise a plan to enlist the elite students of the capital to be mentors to all the tributes this year in hopes that they can turn them into spectacles and then boost the ratings. There's also a cash prize incentive for the mentor whose tribute is the triumphant one in the games. And Snow desperately needs this cash prize because his family are on the cusp of poverty. Coriolanus is assigned the female tribute from District 12, a tenacious singer called Lucy Gray Baird, who's played by Rachel Zegler, who Coriolanus develops complex feelings for. At first he views Lucy as his potential ticket to prosperity, but soon after he finds himself falling for her southern covey charms and will do anything that he can to ensure that she survives the games. So that's enough plot, let's talk about the good and the bad, okay? What's good about this film? Well, first of all, the performances in this are terrific. Tom Blythe, I don't think I've seen him in anything before, but he was wicked as Coriolanus. It's his journey we follow, and Blythe does an excellent job of layering the character, because he's not the President Snow that we know in the original Hunger Games movies, okay? As a lad, he is ambitious and intelligent, dare I say, even innocent, but Snow's story, it really is a cautionary tale of how power has the ability to corrupt us. And when he gets his first taste of power, you can see how it taints him. A major theme of the story is the line that exists within all of us between good and evil. It's a dichotomy that exists within all of us. And it's very applicable to John Snow, John Snow? Coriolanus Snow, <laughs> sorry. Wrong franchise, and Lucy Gray Bed, okay? They're kind of opposites of each other, or two halves of the same coin. He's heads and she's tails. They're both tested in this film and have to make horrible choices purely on the grounds of self-preservation. But that's what makes Coriolanus a fascinating mentor for Lucy, because at first it seems like he's doing it for selfish, ambitious reasons, but then as he develops actual feelings for her, is he doing it because he really cares for her, or because he wants to continue on his father's legacy? It's complicated, it's murky, and that's what makes the character fascinating. And Tom Blythe does an amazing job of conveying all these contradicting feelings that he's having as Coriolanus. Rachel Zegler also shines as Lucy Gray. She is very charismatic, although I will say her slight southern twang does dip in and out occasionally, especially when she's singing, it just kind of evaporates completely. But my God, when she sings, 
Run for cover. My god, that voice. Jason Schwartzman is a comic delight as the weatherman slash magician slash host of the Hunger Games Lucky Flickerman. Peter Dinklage brought great depth to High Bottom, but Violet Davis ate it up and left no crumbs as Dr. Gall. I want to see Viola Davis in more villainous roles. She was so good in this. Like, she is not at all how I envisioned Dr. Gall in my head as I was reading the book, but she might have actually been better. Like, she just breathed life into this character, understood the excitement, had fun with it, and elevated the role. Viola Davis shows up and gets the job done. I also liked Francis Lawrence's direction in this. It is similar to his previous Hunger Games outings, but if you pay close attention, you'll notice there's some subtle differences in this one. Firstly, I like that he incorporated visually that line between good and evil. You'll notice in the film, there's a lot of shots where you've got Lucy Gray on one side and Coriolanus on the other, symbolizing both sides of the spectrum between good and evil. There's a very telling shot where Lucy Gray and the other tributes are in this zoo cage and Coriolanus is on one side, she's on the other, and there's a bar between them that's acting as a line between good and evil and how easy it is for one to cross over into the other. I also noticed that Francis Lawrence often shoots Coriolanus from a worm's eye point of view as in having the camera looking slightly up at him. It subtextually hints to the audience of his rise to his presidential stature, as if we're looking up at a powerful figure. I also really love the aesthetic of this film because the film is set 64 years before Katniss first enters the Hunger Games. Society was obviously not as well developed at that point, and it's well realized in the costumes, the props, and the settings. The technology is more vintage, like the televisions they use to watch the Hunger Games are boxier and have more pixels on the screen, as opposed to like the more recent Hunger Games when the crowds are watching them on big projections and are like HD quality. The fashion is less opulent and over the top as it is in Katniss's time. Like there are no epi trinkets here. In the capital, it's still regal and you can see hints of its evolution, particularly in Hunter Schaefer's seamstress character, Tigress, who is the cousin of Coriolanus. Even the arena is less advanced. They don't have those pop-up pods where the tributes enter the arena. The cornucopia in the center of the games in this one is essentially a pile of rubble. In the earlier days of the games, it was definitely more swords and sandals than it was pageant, but that's kind of the point. The games only got more popular over time because the game makers made them more elaborate and spectacular, all in service of boosting those ratings. So yeah, the aesthetic in this film is still very much Pan Am, it's just less advanced, and I really appreciate it. The costume work from Trish Somerville is great, even if the costumes aren't as eye-grabbing as the original four movies, there's still some great costume designs, particularly Lucy Gray's um, colorful dress that she wears in the arena. For those of you asking, no, I don't think it's gonna get the Oscar nomination for costume design, even though the costumes are great in this. You just have to remember that none of the Hunger Games movies got uh, a nomination for costume design, and they had far more extravagant and elaborate designs than what you get in Battle of Songbirds and Snakes. As for negatives, the issue that I think most people are gonna have with this film is the same issue that people have with the book, and that is that it's a bit too long. After I came out of the film, most people that I talked to agreed that the first two acts of the film were great, very gripping, but the last third of the film managed to be somehow both baggy and rushed. Important character moments do happen quite rapidly, but at the same time, it also feels like it takes a while for it to get to the ending. But because I'd read the book, I was kind of expecting that, so it didn't bother me as much as it did other people. I actually thought the ending of this film was really satisfying. Thematically, it all really does come together, and Snow's character journey really does feel complete. His reason for believing in the Hunger Games crystallizes. It all comes together. But I will say, while I did find the ending satisfactory, I do think it does take a bit of time to get there, and it does feel a bit sluggish. And I guess the reason I wasn't blown away by this film is that it just didn't hit the heights of The Hunger Games or Catching Fire. But I did love that even though it's a prequel, the themes of becoming who we are, spectacle and reality TV still feel resonant to today. Even the fact that Lucky Flickerman is the ancestor of Stanley Tucci's Caesar Flickerman in the other Hunger Games movies 
feels like a bit of a commentary on the entertainment industry's Nepo baby system. There's also substance in here about the fragility of society and mankind and how when society collapses, we all have the capacity to give in to our primal instincts, to kill or be killed, to be predator or prey. But again, it's nothing that hasn't really been said in the previous books or films. So while it is a fun movie and does have something to say, it's just not as original or as fresh as the first time around. So let's ask those three questions. Firstly, would I watch it again? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna watch it in a few weeks time again with Glenn, but it will definitely be a staple in our eventual Hunger Games rewatch marathon. Although I guess I'll have to watch this one first before I watch the Jennifer Lawrence movies, if we're gonna do it in a linear timeline. Question two, do I recommend it for you guys? Yeah, I do. If you're a fan of the book, I will say it is a pretty faithful adaptation. I think you're gonna enjoy it like I did. And if you're a fan of the movies like I was, there's enough ingredients in here of those movies that I think you'll enjoy, like spectacle, violence, social commentary, a complex romance. There's lots of little nods to the other films, like the first mentioning of May the Odds Be Ever In Your Favor, as well as a few character names here or there that you might recognize. And if you're a fan of the first four movies, I do think by watching this one, it will only enrich in your experience of rewatching the other Hunger Games movies, because it just adds more depth and insight and nuance into the character of President Snow, and also how Panem became the Panem that we know in the Katniss world of Hunger Games. I will say it does have its fair share of violent moments, so if you're easily triggered by violence, then approach with caution, but I will say the violence isn't excessively gory or bloody or anything like that, but it's just something to be aware of before going in. Also, if you have a fear of snakes, approach with caution. And third question, what score to get out of 10? A solid prequel with terrific performances and a really good aesthetic. I do think it's a bit on the lengthy side and I don't think it quite reaches greatness, but I still had a pretty good time watching this film. So I'm gonna give The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes a score of seven out of 10. But as always guys, it's just one book's opinion. I'd love to hear from you. Have you read the book? Have you seen the film? What did you think of either? How would you rank this film in all the Hunger Games franchise? Whatever you have to say, let me know in that comment section down below. If you want more movie, TV and Oscars related content, don't forget to click subscribe. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Airfield, and I'll see you next time.